Well, greetings everybody. Now we are going to get right into the Word. Uh, we're going to preach from Acts 13, and um, we're just going to look at the justification that comes by faith and that which God gives us freely in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to, let's go to Acts 13. I'm very excited about the gospel, man. I'm very excited about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's always fresh. It always gives life. It always satisfies. doesn't matter what the situation is. I mean, you can be in the middle of the Africa bush, your car breaks down, you sit there, no communication, whatever, and you'll find that this gospel can give you peace. People can go through a divorce, and you can find that the gospel can give you peace. You can, uh, you can lose a loved one, and you can find the gospel can give you peace. This message is the power of God unto salvation. It gives peace that surpasses all, all understanding. It is a message uh, that we can give our lives to. It is a message that gives us life, and we can give our life to this message. For it is the truth. Now, we're going to go to Acts 13.32. This is Paul, and he's, and he's preaching the gospel. He says, We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors. He has fulfilled it for us, their children, by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He took a nap. He was buried with the ancestor and ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Now, before I get into the next verse, and you guys know I've preached on this so many times before. Paul comes and he says, I've got good news for you. I've got very good news for you. And the good news is that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And he basically says that there were promises made to the ancestors. There were promises made to Abraham. There were promises made to David. There were promises made to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, to, um, to the people of God. And those promises are fulfilled in our time when Jesus was raised from the dead. That's what he says. And now he says here that this uh, resurrection of Jesus uh, gives us something specific. And let's read verse 36 again. It says, Now when David had served his purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, because Jesus' physical body did not see decay, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, through the fact that this man is raised from the dead and he is above corruption, he is above death, he is above decay, through him forgiveness of sins are proclaimed to you. Through him everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So what is he saying here? Um, in our introduction, we mentioned, and I think I, I'm going to just quickly, um, yeah, I'm just going to mention Romans uh, 5 there, Romans 4 verse 5. We need to believe in the God that justifies the ungodly. Because the promise that comes from God is justification for the ungodly. God will justify you with a brand new life. God will justify you with peace. God will justify you uh, with a life uh, free from anxiety and fear and depression and all those kind of things. He'll justify you with that kind of a life through the man Jesus 
who is above decay and corruption. When we look at uh, just normal news, politics, and we, you, can, you can take news from any country. doesn't matter if it's South Africa or what, whatever country it is. I was saying to Eliana, you know, in South Africa, sometimes we think, man, it would be better to live in another country. But if you look at the news in the other countries and you look at South Africa, and you basically say, well, let's stay with the devil we know. You know, it's like everywhere. Uh, things are just, there is a form of corruption doesn't matter where you go. When you look at uh, any form of government or whatever man can try in his own power to justify people with life, to bring true justice, you'll find one problem. And the problem is that those who want to bring justice are subject to corruption themselves because they are mortal humans. They are mortal. That is it. It's not something we we should be ashamed of, you know, to say that, man, in my life as a human, I am mortal and I've got shortcomings and I need a justification that can come from one that is immortal, above sin, above death, above temptation and so forth. You know, if you can, you can take any leader of a country, that leader of a country in some form or fashion will have fears, he will have anxieties, he will be biased. Um, he's, he's got the, w- the way he was brought up in mind. Uh, he's got uh, his own in mind. Th- that is just things that is simply just there that we can do nothing about. But when we look at Jesus, Jesus is pure. He cannot be tempted. When he was on the earth, yes, he was tempted. But now, where he is now as our leader, he is above temptation. He cannot be corrupt. He can only do what the Father has told him to do and what is also his will to bring us life. That's what he can do. Now, verse 38, and this is the powerful verse. It says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus... The forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, the power of life that he stands in brings a justification to us that he will set us free from every sin. So it is not our job to try and get rid of every sin. It is, our, it is our job, if you want to call it like that, to hear what God is saying, what he can do, and to trust him. To rest in the justification which leads to or manifests in the fruit of the Spirit by the doing of God. We can see here that Paul basically writes this, or he preaches this, Luke writes it, in a way that is just actually mind-boggling. He gets it right to write it in a way where you can kind of see that all of creation uh, waited for something to happen, that they can be free from sin and death. And here Jesus Christ comes, and through promise, he justifies all. The ungodly, those who don't have life, those who are flooded with sins, those who are flooded with fear and whatsoever is not just and right in accordance to God's original plan. He will justify them with life. He will bring them that life. Now I've read this verse twice, but I want to read it again. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know, because Jesus was raised from the dead, I want you to know that through Jesus... The forgiveness or the deliverance, I'm going to use my own words here, of the fruit of the flesh is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every possible sin. So if there are things in your life that you feel, man, I don't want this. Uh, You feel, "I, I wish I cannot hate or I wish I would love certain people but I cannot do it and you feel an anger in your heart you feel upset you feel depressed whatever things there are that word sin uh, there simply means to miss the goal not to partake in what God has dreamt for you 
So whatever you are not partaking in that God has dreamt for you, the justification would be that God has promised it to you and it shall manifest in you. He'll, ma- he will just, he'll bring what is just towards you. And it's only just if the Almighty God has promised you holiness, promised you His life, promised, uh, promised that you are an heir, it is only just that you would inherit and take part in His life by Him for He has promised. If I promise my son something, it would be unjust for me to promise and not deliver. Now, one friend always jokes, he says, man, it's enough to have made a promise. To do is now getting a bit out of hand. It's too much. (laughs) Well, in God, with God, it doesn't work like that. God promises, and because he's promised, justification would be to see the promise manifest. So it is not by our own works. God loves us. He knows your pain. He knows the difficult times that you are going through. He knows your joys. He knows the friendships that you have. He knows where you are. And he will never, ever, ever forget you. I want to read. Last night I spoke to a friend of mine, Andris Noer. And, um, and just before I called him, I read this verse. And then he also mentioned this verse as we were talking And I thought I have to read it this morning. Uh, Isaiah 49. I want to read verse 16 here. I'm going to read from verse 14. It says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Listen to what this verse says here. Can a mother forget the baby at her breasts? Can a mother that is basically breastfeeding, that while she's breastfeeding a child, forget her child? (laughs) Impossible. Let me read it again. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? And have no compassion on the child she has born. I watched a a documentary of a person that has murdered people. And they spoke to this this man's mother. And uh, this guy got life imprisonment. um, And I think he escaped, I don't know if he escaped from jail or something like that. And then she helped her son to get out of the country into Brazil. Then he was there for many years and eventually they they caught him and brought him back to South Africa and he's now in jail uh, for the rest of his life. And, And they asked her, they said, should he be in jail? She said, yes, because he murdered people. And then she says, but I can never stop to love my son. He will always be my son. And I will always have compassion. She said, I knew that I had to deliver him to the police. And eventually it came through her that the police caught him. But she said, I had to help him escape because I don't know, didn't know what to do. He is my son. I have compassion. And this is what the scripture is saying here. It says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast? And have no compassion on the child she has born. Now listen to what the scripture says. This is God's word. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. What God is saying is, is there is a possibility that a mother can forget her child while she even breastfeeds him. There's a possibility that a mother can have no compassion on the child that she has born. But with God, it is impossible. With God, it is impossible. He will never, never forget. He will always be there. Then it says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. You want to say something? Oh, okay. So what God is saying here is that 
He engraved us on the palms of his hands. We know that that is in the cross of Jesus Christ. Those marks will be there forevermore. And we are engraved. He basically tattooed us into his hands. The Almighty God will never forget us. He will never leave us. A mother might leave a child. I mean, I think um, if, if I get upset with one of my sons and then I say, no, man, I, he shouldn't have done this. He should do this. man. What, what is it with him? Then you always find Elena. You know, I don't want you to talk bad about my sons. They are my sons, you know. It's like there's a compassion that is inside her heart, a love for her children. God says that his love for you is much more, much more. He says there's a possibility for a mother to just let go of her child. But there is no possibility that the Almighty God can do that to you. He's come to give you life. He has he's engraved you into his hands. He says, your walls are ever before me. Talks about, that walls talk about a city and the safety of the people. He says, your safety is forever before me. There is never a time where God, there's not a, 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 any second in the day where your safety, your life, who you are is not in his mind. You've been engraved in, into his hands and he justifies with life he justifies you with the resurrection power and when he sees sin in your life he does not make it your responsibility to get rid of that sin because he knows if it is your responsibility you'll never be free you'll always be in bondage you'll always be entangled into what cannot into something that is always coming short that's why he's made it his responsibility to give you life Holiness is uh, holiness has, has got much more to do with God fulfilling His promises towards us and us trusting Him than what it's got to do with trying to follow after the laws and the commandments and all those kind of things. Holiness is found in God setting us apart for His purpose and then Him bringing it forth in us. You know, I've mentioned it many times. The fruit of the Spirit is not a command. It is simply what the word says. It's a fruit or a result of the Holy Spirit. So we don't find the law and then we find grace and then we find some place where we, we have to bring these two things together. No, there is works righteousness and then there is grace, the grace and the love of God. And it is not our job to bring forth works by grace. It is God's job to bring forth fruit in you. The only thing we can do is believe that it is so and expect it, want it, desire it, seek for it by having a longing in our heart that God would bring it forth in us. That is, that is what I believe the scripture teaches us. Now I want to go to a famous passage, John 3. Today I just decided I'm just going to preach a very... A uh, simple message, uh, but so, so powerful. John chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse 15, 16. We all know this. <clears throat> it says in verse 14, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes may have eternal life. You remember what I, what, I, what I read about Abraham? Or just quoted about Abraham? Abraham believed in the God that justifies the ungodly. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham was justified, not by his own works, but by believing in the God that justifies the ungodly. In the very same way it says here in, in verse 14 in, in Romans 3, it now defines the justification. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. 
So what is the justification that God will justify you with? He will justify you with eternal life. He will justify you with the fruit of the Spirit. So eternal life, the fruit of the Spirit, all those kind of things are things that God promises and we believe it. If we believe it by simple faith, simple trust that it is so and that he brings it to us, we will find the power of the resurrection justifying us with that. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay. So what does God want us to have? What is the justification? It's eternal life. It's life that is not taken away from us. It's not lacking life. That is the justification that he has come to give us. Whosoever believes in him is not condemned. But whosoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So, (laughs) the justification that comes by God is through Jesus by believing and trusting that he will do it. Condemnation is not to believe that it is for free. That is condemnation. That is what it is. Now I want to tell you that the message of Christ is robust enough, it's powerful enough to handle the situations that we have in this world today. In this world today, if we look around us, if we look, I'm just, uh, most of the people that are slotted into this service this morning is from South Africa. If we look at the changing of our constitution, for instance, in most countries, if it comes to the change of a constitution, that's serious, very serious stuff. Uh, it, it is, we look at the changing of our constitution, we look at what's happening in the politics, we look at all those kind of things, and we can think, Lord God, you know, um, I, we just hope that you don't forget us. <laughs> we are still here. We, we are your children. Remember, we are still here. Uh, how will, how is this, these things going to work out in this world? I can tell you this. I found in my own life, the more we try to find out, the more I try to find out how it's going to work out, the more I've stressed myself out. But the more I've come to the place where I say, it's just going to work out and let me just enjoy today. Today I'm here and I'm preaching this message and I've got uh, a good internet. It's working. The computer is working. Everything is working. My uh, my sons, all of them are here at home. Uh, Elena is here. We are healthy. Glory to God. We enjoy this moment with God right now. And that's what we have now. I mean, we can try and live in the future all the time, and we can try and live in the past all the time. Uh, But what about now? God is called the great I am. He is now, here. Enjoy what is given to you right now. So we enjoy the peace that we have in this moment where he justifies us with life. And how it will work out in the future, it's up to God. It's up to God. But what I do see is that if I look at the apostles, wherever they were, doesn't matter what they've gone through, they had a song on their lips. They had a joy in their heart. We find that the apostles, what took joy away from them was not a lack of money or a lack of freedom or any of those things or politics. What took joy away from them, what would upset the apostles was false doctrine. (laughs) <laughs> that's what made the people upset false doctrine they're not believing the true gospel or what would upset Paul was if he would preach and people come in behind him and they mess up the church and bring false doctrine because if people are not saturated with the truth it brings pain to their lives I want to quickly go to um, two more verses I'm going to go to Isaiah 42 we've read this in the last two Sundays Um, But this is just so powerful And then I want to just cross-reference it to Matthew It says here That Jesus will not shout or cry or raise a voice in the streets What that means is he's not 
is, is, is not a salvation doesn't come through politics that's what it basically means any political leader that has to make his voice known in the streets through placards advertising and all those kind of things you can just say that is just a politician that is not the way of salvation um, that is not where deliverance and freedom lie um, that's what it says. Jesus is not in that category. And then it says here, a bruised reed, he will not break. A smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. Or it says here, he will bring forth justice unto victory. He will bring forth justice unto victory. Matthew twelve twenty quotes that as well. And he says that he will, uh, uh, a, 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 a reed, um, a bruised reed, he will not break. A smoldering wick, he will not snuff out until he brings forth uh, justice unto truth. So justice unto truth and justice unto victory is the very same thing. Whereby we can see that victory and truth is the same. That's why we can say grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and victory came by Jesus Christ. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Truth means victory. You'll know the victory and the victory of Jesus will set you free. That is what it means if you go and read John there. So we find here that there is a justice that's unto truth. And then it's translated in Greek as a justice unto victory. So the truth, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, is you will know the victory of Jesus Christ. And the victory that there is in Jesus Christ shall set you free. You might feel bruised, you might feel weak, you might feel, feel, feel you're going through a very difficult time. I mean, I know most of you that are slotted in here. I know your lives. I know there are people that are struggling, that are going through very, very difficult times struggling with just it's, it's just unimaginable difficult times i want to tell you that god cannot forget you a mother might forget her child but god cannot forget you he cannot forget you god cannot lie god is not a man that he should lie he's not in the category of man fallen man that he should lie Jesus Christ, the man that was raised from the dead, that possesses the fullness of the Godhead bodily, he brings you life. He brings you victory. He cannot forget you. And you might feel that your life is already bruised. You might find that you are just a smoldering wick. There's no more flame. There's nothing for you. I want to tell you that he will not snuff it out. He will, he will rekindle the fire. He will give you life by his resurrection power and he will bring what is just to you. He has brought it in Christ and right now he can justify you with a peace that just floods your heart as you hear this message. He loves you. He cares for you. I want to go to uh, Ezekiel 36. So many times we get so caught up in what we must do and how we must get it right. Listen to this. This is Ezekiel 34. First, I think, let me just quickly, oh well, I'll, I'll go to 34 a bit later. Let's go to 36 first, 24. And then we can go back to 34 there. It says, this is God's promise. Remember, we are justified by God. And we just believe the promise. Here is one of his promises. And this links up with Ezekiel 34. It says, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Whose job is it to make us clean? It is God's job. How does he make us clean? By sprinkling clean water on us. What is the clean water? It's the Spirit of God. The, uh, it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is the clean water? It's the pure gospel of His love and His grace. That is what He will clean us with. That would mean that if we are at a place where we try to clean up our own lives by willpower, we are walking in unbelief. If you want to make your own life clean, you're walking in unbelief. But if you rely upon the one that says that He will cleanse you, by his word and as you believe his word he brings it forth then you'll be truly clean 
I read verse 25 again. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Glory to God. Who will cleanse people from idol worship? God will. <laughs> the, the message is not you get rid of your idols and come and serve me. No, the message is God will get rid of the idols in our lives. How does he do that? He raises a man from the dead, and as we identify with the resurrected Christ, seated at the right hand of God, and we identify with him, and we see the abundance of life that flows from that, we find that we don't worship other things anymore. He sets us free. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now there was a teaching that I spoke about, the hardening of the heart, uh, which explains this in its historic context there. But just in short, we can put it this way. God will take away the heart of stone. He'll take away the belief system of the law. That which was written on stones, he'll take that away. We know that in the Egyptian culture, they've had this uh, stone wherein, on which they would write things, which was basically like magic, which, uh, which they would put in the grave when somebody is, um, is buried so that the, basically the angel of death can be tricked by this heart that was like false so that the person can enter into eternal life that's more what this is about but what is taking place here is is that god is saying listen you will not have to be afraid that you will not partake in eternal life i'll take the heart of stone i'll take your efforts to try and trick your own mind through good things and good works that you think you do i'm taking all of that away i'll give you a heart of flesh a belief system of flesh what is that our hearts will be flooded with the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead in the flesh and that he is seated in his flesh at the right hand of the Father. That's the heart we will have. We will have a heart of flesh, not a heart of law. We will have a heart of flesh. And it says, here, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So who, who keeps the laws of God? Is it us? No. The reason why we live holy is because God has moved us from death to life by His resurrection power. As our hearts have been cleansed from the stoniness, the, the law, the works righteousness, self-righteousness and all those kind of things to a place where we have a heart of flesh. The heart, the belief system, the Bible says with the heart we believe. The belief system where we believe unto the resurrected flesh of Jesus Christ, which spells the salvation of our flesh, where we are saved from sin in the flesh by the doing of God. Reading verse 27, And you now will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors and you will be my people and I will be your God. Isn't that beautiful? God says that He will cleanse us. He will bring us His inheritance. He will bring us righteousness. Then He is our God and we are His people. The moment we bring righteousness to ourselves by our own works, my goodness, then you are your own God. You're like a narcissist. A narcissist is kind of in his own eyes the perfect person. He is the God and he is the worshipper of the God. Uh, he, he, he thinks he's God and he worships himself. Uh, we don't want to have a narcissistic a belief when it comes to our Christianity. We believe in God. He's our God and we are His people. He cares for us. Okay, Romans 1. I'm just running through well-known scriptures this morning. And verse 16. 
Now I'm going to have to read this in the Afrikaans as well. I'll just directly translate it there for you guys. But this is what the NIV says. It says, For I'm not ashamed of the good news or the gospel, because the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The word believe means to have your mind at rest in the integrity of God. To have your mind at rest in the integrity of God. So you cannot believe unless you first behold the integrity of God. You cannot believe unless the integrity of God persuades you. So you have to look at the scriptures and see the integrity of God portrayed in Jesus Christ. And as we see the integrity of God in raising Jesus from the dead and how he loves us, that integrity wins our hearts and our heart gets to rest. I want to tell you that um, I, do, do, I do think that there is a place where we give over to God. But I also believe that it runs, uh, there's almost like a gray area where, where you decide or where you say, well, I'm trusting God. And where it's God's responsibility to win your heart. It's almost like, it's like relationships, Lena and I. You know, there was a time where I, it, it was up to me to win her heart. And when I, and then there was a time when she, when I did win her heart, but where she gave over to what was happening in her heart. So it is not just the one, it is, there's a giving over, it's a relationship thing here. So it says here, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who has his mind at rest in the integrity of God. First to the Jew and also the Gentile, for in the good news, the righteous actions of God is revealed, a righteousness that is from, from faith first to last, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. Now I want to just read you, they read this in the Afrikaans and you will just see how beautiful it is. Because I want to tell you, God never, there was never a place in history where you had to live by the law. It has always been only by faith. The Bible says that the people uh, perished in the desert because they did not believe. If they believed, they wouldn't have perished in the desert, but they did not believe. So Romans 1 here says the following. And what a point I'm trying to make is, it's always been, by, uh, uh, it's always been you live by faith. And not by works. I just read in the Afrikaans. And then I'll just translate it to English as it's written here. It says. Ek skaam my nie vir die evangelie nie. Want het is die kracht van God tot verlossing vir elkeen wat geloo. Eerst vir die jood, maar ook vir die Griek. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. As we know that scripture. Uh, for, um, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes. For Jew first and also to the Greek. But now it says. Want daarin word die word geopenbaar dat Godse gerechtigheid geheel en al op geloof beris. It says, for therein it is revealed that God's righteousness fully, completely rests on faith. As it's written, the just shall live by faith. Isn't that beautiful? So it says that the justification of God, the righteousness of God fully rests on faith from beginning to end. From Old Testament to New Testament, from Abraham, everyone, it rested on faith. It was about relying in the God that is good to us. Glory to God. I'm ending off with Ephesians. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed as something that has always just depended upon him fulfilling his promise and we just resting in his integrity. That's how it works. That's how it works. And I want to encourage you, if you are not yet seeing the fruit that you are expecting to see, I want you to meditate on, because that happens to me, it happens to Eliana, it happens to my sons, everybody. There's time in your life where you believe and you don't see. Read Hebrews 11. Look at Abraham. Look at Joseph. I mean, Joseph was in jail one day. Next day, he's leading Egypt. Uh, look at David. Look at Israel. 
Look at all those things. There's time sometimes that goes past, but it doesn't make that what we believe is not true if we're not seeing it right now. We just believe. God is good. Amen. Okay, Ephesians 5. And I'm ending off with this. This is also a well-known passage. It says, Husbands, love your wives as just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So what is he saying? He's giving advice to the husbands, but he's actually preaching the gospel. He says Christ loves the church and he gave himself for her. I want to tell you that God gave Jesus and Jesus gave himself to you. And the spirit, the fullness of God, Father, Son and Spirit is towards you and for you. It says to make her holy, cleansing her, by the washing with water through the word. Remember Ezekiel where it says, I will wash you, I will cleanse you, I will make you clean. Then you will be truly clean. Unless Jesus makes you clean, you can never be truly clean. You cannot cleanse yourself. He cleanses you. You believe him. And to present you to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. So how did God love us? He loves us as his very own body. How do you forget your own body? It's impossible. How do you not pamper your own body? It is impossible. How don't you, you take food, you eat, you drink water, you, you make sure that you live. This is how, what God says about us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always be there for us. He will always provide for us. He cleanses us. He makes us beautiful. It says here, after all, no one ever hates his own body, but they will feed and care for their body, just as Christ does to the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He says, because a, a man loves his own body, and he becomes one with his wife, and they are one body, he will leave his parents and stick to the wife. He will be with his wife because they are one in body. That is why Jesus will come to earth and live with us because we are one body with him. He can never forget you. He can never forsake you. He can never leave you. Even if governments become crazy, even if people want to control your life, if people want to say in everything, it doesn't matter. We, as the church, are under the rule of God. Hallelujah. He loves you and he will always love you. Be encouraged by the simple message of God's love and grace today. Let us pray together. Father, I want to thank you that you love us. I want to thank you that you care for us. I want to thank you that you've stretched out your hands of compassion towards us. As we behold your hands, we see how you have engraved us into your hands. As we see that, we also behold the glorious resurrected Jesus and we behold what you have given us. The hope, the promise we can have. Thank you that you clean us and we are truly clean. Thank you that you love us and we are truly loved. Thank you, Father, that you come and make promises to us that we through these precious promises might be partakers of the divine nature and so share in the life that you have dreamt for us from before the world began. Father, I pray for everybody that is in our internet church. I thank you, Lord, that you... Comfort each one of them that are going through very, very difficult times. I thank you, Lord, that praises is raised in the mouths of all of those that have seen your provision and love for them. And prayers and supplication is made by those that are going through difficult times to you. And Lord, we are happy and we are happy with those that, that are happy and we with those that go through difficult times. We feel with them and we stand in prayer with them. Thank you that you are the one that always provide. You are the one that always brings a favorable outcome. You are the one that is the source of all joy and peace. To the point that we can be happy right now. 
because we have the great I am, not the great will be, but the great I am. And whatever day we are in, even tomorrow, when we arrive at tomorrow, we find the I am there providing life for us. Amen and amen. Church, I want to thank you that you have slotted in and that I could serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ. If this message has blessed you, please share it with one of your friends. There might just be somebody that really needs this message. And as you feel a prompting in your heart, man, I think I should send this message to somebody. Take the YouTube link. It will be up on YouTube and, uh, and share it with them. It might just bless them greatly. So uh, we will then chat to you guys again in the week through the daily devotionals. And, um, and then I will see you in the week and then next Sunday as we bring our Afrikaans message again. Thank you so much and God bless.